morning, everybody. Good morning. Want to welcome those of you who are in person. We want to welcome those of you that are watching online. Uh, welcome to another Story Sunday. Uh, our Story Sundays are those where we tell some of the big stories of God uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, we're still rolling our way through the Old Testament. And so uh, the story that you are going to hear later on today comes from the sixth book. Uh, and as I was kind of reflecting on uh, some of the psalms that really inspire or speak to our story Sundays, uh, I was drawn to Psalm 145. You've likely heard uh, me read it a number of times. Uh, but Psalm 145 says, I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. Today, we are coming to connect with this story, and uh, we are going to proclaim God's power. We are going to meditate on his majestic and glorious splendor. Uh, the generations are going to communicate to one another as our children uh, tell you about God's mighty acts. And so it's just a wonderful uh, time. We're very excited that you are here. Uh, I want to pray, and then we'll, continue, we'll begin to worship the Lord in song. Father God, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for this day. Uh, Father, we thank you that we have another opportunity to encounter your uh, majestic miracles. We have another, uh, in, another opportunity to teach each generation about all the things that you do. And we thank you that we, your word says, Jesus, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we just worship and celebrate you. Uh, and we pray that as we dive into your word today, as we lift your name high today, uh, we pray that you'd be honored and glorified by your spirit, that you'd speak to each one of us. I always pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to join us today in worship. Uh, if you're wanting to join in standing, join and stand and sing, and we'll raise a hallelujah together. of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. And I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise. Defeated, 
Sing a little louder. 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 Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. And heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder.
shall come with a shout of acclamation and lead me home. What joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my God, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art.
God, we just celebrate your goodness. We celebrate your grace and your faithfulness to us. Uh, Father, I love how your word says that uh, even when we are faithless, you remain faithful because you cannot deny yourself. That's just who you are. Uh, and we are recipients of your grace. We're recipients of your faithfulness today. Uh, and so we thank you for that. We pray as we uh, move in a few minutes to the story that we would see that big picture uh, that we would come to understand all that you have for us. We would come to understand uh, your amazing power. We'd come to understand how great you are. Uh, and we also just want to become like you. And that's our heart's desire. We want to become more and more and more like Jesus. And we know that that's your heart for us as well. Uh, and so as we think now about generosity and giving, uh, we uh, say our giving liturgy together as a way to just look to you uh, for that transformation. And uh, so let's pray our giving liturgy together. Father in heaven, there is nothing we have that you have not given to us to spend everything on ourselves and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world. But we who call Jesus Lord are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not on the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have. Lord, help us to be trustworthy with little that we can be trusted with much. Help us to give what we cannot keep, to gain what we cannot lose. Above all, help us to be generous because you, Father, are generous. May we show what you are like to all the world. May this be true of our community. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. I will say, in, uh, in uh, an element of comedic timing, 
Um, I was uh, just thinking about money before I got up to say that prayer, uh, and I was honestly thinking about what it would be like to have more money that I didn't work necessarily for. I was, I was beginning to dream about, wow, what it would be, wouldn't it be nice just to win the lottery and just have uh, so much more and an abundance? Uh, and as I was kind of daydreaming about that a little bit while still worshiping and thanking God for all of his faithfulness and his goodness, I get up there and I'm brought right back into the, wait a minute, God is my provider. God has always been faithful to me. Uh, and it's all about, it's just all about that, that generosity of heart less than the material quantity. So uh, I find that that prayer convicts me at the most appropriate times. I hope it does it for you as well. It's not something that you just go on autopilot for, but I do hope that it is something that arrests your attention uh, every now and again. Uh, by way of announcements, it's a fairly simple Sunday announcement-wise. Uh, we're going to be celebrating communion uh, as part of the service, and we are also having a potluck downstairs. Uh, and so you are all invited to do that. Uh, we have our sort of all-in-one communion cup, and I just want to let you know in the top, uh, there is the wafer, then underneath is the juice. Uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to. We won't have these for too much longer, uh, but I did order an extra box accidentally, uh, and so we have a few more uh, months of this probably before we go back to the, uh, the true bread experience. So I just want to give you the heads up so that you know, because it's, it's always much more awkward when they're, in, when they're in the middle of communion, and I'm trying to explain that part to you. Uh, all right, it is now kids' time, so kids, come on down, uh, and I'm very excited to invite Kathy uh, and our special guest, Sandra. Uh, they're going to lead this next time of the story. Uh, so Kathy and Sandra, come on down. Kids, come on down. We're very excited. Aha. And then storytellers, uh, you guys can sneak over here under the chairs over here because we got some stuff to do too. Oh, yeah, me and Mike say. <laughs> so this is my friend Sandra. I've known her for quite a while through theater and different things. And so she's come. I'm going to talk to her after, but I'm going to start with the story first. And now we'll see how well I do with mics and a storybook and sharing pictures. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the warrior leader. Do you guys know who we might be talking about? <laughs> yeah, Blaze has insider information though sometimes. <laughs> After Moses died, God gave his people a new leader. His name was Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Joshua was going to lead God's people into the special land God had promised to give them. By this time, God's people had been wandering around in the baking desert for 40 years. So you can imagine how sick they were of sand and anything yellow and tense and walking and being hot and how happy they were to reach the edge of the desert and see their beautiful new home. Right there in front of them, all cool and green and lovely, there was only one problem, Jericho. Jericho was a city, but it wasn't just any old city. It was a fortress, and it stopped anybody from getting into the land. The people looked at Jericho, at the big, giant, scary walls around it, at the towering ramparts, at the heavy iron gates bolted shut, and at each other. That shows us. The ramparts, I don't think I can make it so all you guys can see. <laughs> what would they do? No one knew, but God knew. And God told Joshua what to do. But Joshua must have looked surprised because it was a very odd battle plan indeed, as we'll soon find out. Although, Mac has a bit of the idea here. <laughs> He must have an inside scoop, too. <laughs> then God made his people a promise. I will always be with you, and I will never, ever leave you. If you do what I say, your lives in the new land will be happy, and everything will go well. So Joshua gathered his army together. They had their swords and spears and shields. They were ready to fight. But the plan wasn't about fighting. It was about trusting and doing what God said. Joshua's army went marching, marching, marching around the city day after day after day. They're too scared to fight, the people in Jericho said. Okay, I'm not going to show this picture until a minute because it gives something away. <laughs> but they were wrong. God's people weren't scared. They were waiting, 
waiting for God to tell them what to do next. On the seventh day, God told his people to march around the city, not once, but seven times. Then God told everybody to make much no as much noise as they could. Has anyone ever told you to make as much noise as you possibly can? Well, imagine that noise. <laughs> You just dream of it, eh, Matthew? Yeah. <laughs> Add 39,999 other people making that noise, too, and you get the idea. You're splitting. And as it turned out, stone splitting, too, because the huge, strong walls of Jericho just crumbled to the ground as if they were made of sand. Jericho vanished in a great cloud of dust. We're going to talk about that noise-making later because God was a little bit more specific. <laughs> so it was that God's people entered their new home and they didn't have to fight to get in. They only had to walk. Joshua s said, God has brought you safely here. Now, will you do what he says? Everyone said, oh, we promise. Only God can make your heart happy, Joshua said. So don't pray to pretend God's. No, they said, never. I'm afraid they didn't keep that promise. And we kind of heard that over and over again in these stories. Eh? I think we still hear it in our own lives, too. They didn't do what God said. And many years later, just as God warned them, things would go badly for God's people. They would lose their homes. Enemies would capture them and take them off as slaves. And God's people would scatter in many different lands. But God's plan was still working. One day, he would give his people a leader and another home. But this home, no one could ever take from them. So that's that part of the story. It gives you kind of an overview. And then we're going to do a song. But first, I'm going to talk to, in the song, you're going to hear the more specifics. Because God told them how to make a noise with a special instrument. And that's why I invited Sandra, so she can show you the instrument. What's the instrument called? It's called the shofar. S-H-O-F-A-R. <laughs> and I think some of you guys know what that is from. Am I right? No, it's not a goat. It's a ram. What, where's the ram? A male sheep. A male sheep. That's good. He was here earlier. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. And how about the other bigger one that I see the on the stage? The horn is from an ibex. It's an African animal. It's very much like an antelope. And you'll be hearing that later. <laughs> You want to give us a sample on this one now? Do you want to hear this? I won't put the mic there, though. <laughs> So each individual in the crowd can make a whole lot more noise if they all had one of those, eh? I don't think everybody did, just the priests, right? Yeah. Wow. So, but Dave's going to play some music for us, for the song. And Matthew is going to share some instruments, so all you guys can play some music with us, too. And then, as we go through the song, there's some special dancers, and then you guys can also get up and dance. And if the guys follow Matthew and the girls follow Sandra, oh, that only gives you one follower. <laughs> you can just split how you'd like <laughs> when you get to the back. And adults can join in too if you wish to dance with us. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. You may talk about your men of Gideon, you may talk about your men of Saul, but there's none like good old Joshua and the battle of Jericho. 
Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Right up the walls of Jericho, they marched with spear in hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, cause the battle is in my hand. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Then the lamb, ram, sheep, horns began to blow, and the trumpets began to sound. Joshua told the children to give a shout, and the walls came tumbling down. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down, and the walls came tumbling down. Thank you, kids. You guys can put the instruments back. Thank you for helping collect that stuff up. And then you can quietly find your way back to the back. Uh, connect with the activity table at the back and find your way to your parents. Welcome to another Story Sunday. Uh, our Story Sundays have two purposes. Uh, first, it gives our storytellers crew a chance to lead in the service as they prepare for and present these stories. Uh, our kids are learning these big stories of the Bible, and they're also learning about being involved in different kinds of stagecraft. Uh, so for this story, our team was involved in set design. You got to watch the wall that we built. Uh, that was very fun to be a part of that. Uh, they also uh, helped to uh, with the choreography. Uh, so I would like to say that uh, I invented that dance. I did not. We, uh, there was kind of a collaborative effort, but a uh, special thanks to Katie Anderson for kind of uh, really dreaming that one out as we kind of all work together. So uh, very, very fun, very fun, as well as learning the story itself. And so our first reason to, uh, to, to do these Story Sundays is it gives our kids just a chance to be involved in a greater way. Uh, but our second reason for these Story Sundays is to help us step back into and learn the big stories and overall narrative of the Bible. Uh, these stories aren't just for the kids, it's also for us, and we often need a chance to step back into and just say, hey, wait a minute, what, what are we even, how, how does this whole book work? So, uh, the Bible that you hold in your hands or that you look at on your phone, uh, that is one book made up of 66 smaller books. These books were written by over 40 authors on three different continents over a span of 1,500 years. But these individual books were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they all tell one story. They tell the story of God's move in history to rescue for himself a people from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation on earth. Every book serves to forward that narrative, and through our story Sundays, we're trying to understand both the individual stories, but also how they fit in the larger story framework. So as we have moved through the story on these story Sundays, uh, we are currently in the Old Testament. The Old Testament consists of 39 of the 66 books. And to help give understanding to the overall structure of the Old Testament in our Bibles, these 39 books can be divided into five sections. So the first five books are called the books of the law, or the books of Moses, or the Pentateuch. 
Uh, these books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, and so far, all of our stories have come from this section. Uh, we've spent about two years doing one story or so a month, um, about 10 stories a year by the time it all kind of works out. Um, and we have only been in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, the Pentateuch deals with the origins of humanity and the fall into sin. It details early attempts to deal with sin, and it also contains God's promises of rescue. From Genesis 12 on, the story begins to follow a family, the family of Abraham, as God seeks to bring rescue to all nations through this family. God blesses this family to be a blessing, and by the end of Genesis, this family will be called the people of Israel. But things do not always go smoothly for them. God had told Abraham that his descendants would be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And by the book of Exodus, that is exactly what happens. And the book of Exodus is all about God's uh, rescue of the people. Uh, God's bringing them, uh, this people who become a large nation, out of slavery in Egypt, uh, into the desert of Sinai. And there God enters into a covenant relationship with them. Through this covenant, God intends to dwell with the Israelite people, uh, lead them, and eventually through them to bring rescue to the whole world. Exodus, Numbers, and Leviticus lay out the rules which will govern this relationship. These books teach us about the holiness of God, and they also tell us story after story of these people who, who've seen God's manifest power, uh, rebelling and mistrusting him. Uh, when, Miss, when Miss Kathy was talking about, you know, it, it seems like this story is familiar, the trust and then the drifting, the trust and then the drifting, uh, that is very much what we see in the early books as well. There's these incredible moments of trust, these incredible moments of confidence, but then there's also those stories of, of rebellion and, and mistrust and confusion. This rebellion leads to broken relationship and punishment. And one significant consequence that is detailed uh, in the book of Numbers is that uh, the, the first generation uh, who, was, who was rescued from Egypt, who were promised to enter the promised land, uh, this group, because of their rebellion, were denied entry. Instead, the people of Israel had to wander for 40 years in the Sinai Desert until that unbelieving generation died off. And then as you come into the book of Deuteronomy, it's a series of speeches, Moses' last words, and a restatement of the law to the new generation uh, as your Israelite people are on the border of the promised land ready to try to enter again. Now, in our story this month, we've moved to the book of Joshua. Joshua is the first book in the second section, the historical books. The historical books are those from Joshua through to Esther. Uh, there's 12 books. They cover about 1,000 years of history. And again, they're focused on God and his relationship with Israel. As the book of Joshua begins, Moses has died, and the people of Israel are now led by Joshua and Eleazar the high priest. Together, they are tasked with leading the Israelite people into the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised to give to the Israelite people. And the book of Joshua details the battles and the campaigns that it takes to get the people into the land. As we've seen through the big stories in the first five books, when God moves on behalf of his people, things change. And in the book of Joshua, there are many, many miracles. Uh, early in the book of Joshua, the Jordan River parts in the height of the spring runoff so the people could cross through safely. Uh, when they do the manna supply, which they've been eating for the last 40 years, uh, it goes away as the people begin to eat the produce of the promised land. And as you move through the book, you encounter dramatic moments of God fighting for Israel, just as he did when he brought them out of Egypt. Uh, some of the, the miracles are even described in a very similar way. And so the book of Joshua is filled with powerful moments of God's intervention and powerful declarations of faith as God's people trust him for victory. Uh, there are a number of favorite verses that come out of Joshua, but uh, one of the ones that has been a favorite to many throughout the years is found in Joshua's conversation with the Lord in Joshua 1. In Joshua 1, 6-9, God says to Joshua, Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. 
This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How many of you have ever heard any of those verses before? Be strong and courageous. The Lord is with you wherever you go. Yeah, generations of God's people have been inspired by this passage. Be strong and courageous. I am with you. As I was reflecting on these words, I was also thinking a little bit about uh, what we call the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Uh, Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. He describes the going, but then he says, And be sure of this, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. I have all power and authority, and I'm with you always. That kind of sounds a little bit like this. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord is with you. And so these words, uh, they have inspired generations of, of God's people, uh, but it's with these words ringing in his ears that Joshua begins to lead the people into what God has promised them. Now, the story that we read in our storyteller's time comes from Joshua 6, and then that last page, Kathy, was Joshua 24. Um, I, I don't know if you, I, it's funny because I'd heard it when we practiced it, but then listening again, I was like, oh, oh yeah, they're, they're jumping from the beginning to the end, they're, they're getting all of Joshua in one, so it's convenient that I'm also doing all of Joshua in one message. Um, yeah, and so it's Joshua 6 and 24, and the battle of Jericho, the first major battle of the Israelites' conquest of the promised land, uh, that story is told in Joshua 6. As you heard, Jericho was a massive fortress protected by high walls and determined defenders. But on the eve of battle, God had given Joshua instructions about how he was to fight the battle. Rather than build siege weapons or try to climb the walls, God had a plan. And in Joshua 6, 1-7, to we read these words. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. So Joshua called together the priests and said, Take up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of it, each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave orders to the people, March around the town, and the armed men will lead the way in front of the Ark of the Lord. Quick aside, does that battle strategy make sense for what you know about siege warfare? No. 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 I mean, marching around, playing some trumpets is generally not... Uh, not the best battle plan. I will say, though, as the kids were dancing around, I did wonder about the structural integrity of our building. I was like, oh, man, is it going to happen again? Uh, I hope not. Yeah. But with this peculiar battle strategy, marching around the town, uh, following the Ark of the Covenant, with the priests worshiping a blowing ram's horn, on the seventh day, after marching around the city seven times, the people gave a great shout, and the walls of Jericho collapsed, opening the city up for the army to move in. And the Israelite people defeated the city of Jericho. Uh, we celebrate this story as one of God's victory, of his people's obedience. We celebrate this story with our kids through animated vegetables to teach them to rely on God first in all things. And there are a number of powerful lessons that we can learn from this story, and we will. But there's one other element that we didn't share in the storyteller's time. There's one other part that our book did not tell you. You see, not all the walls came down. In Joshua 2, uh, Joshua had sent two spies into Jericho to assess the city. They looked around the walls, they counted the troops, they spied out the city. And as night fell, uh, they spent the night at the home of a lady named Rahab. Uh, now, it seems from the story that Rahab was involved in shady business. Uh, I'm keeping the story PG. Uh, but it seems she ran a by-the-hour rooming house. That's probably the best way that I can describe it uh, at this level. Uh, and the king had heard that, his, that some spies were in the city. He traced them to Rahab's business, and he sent soldiers to Rahab to arrest the spies. But Rahab had hidden these spies. She convinced the soldiers that the spies had already escaped. And later, in the middle of the night, Rahab let the men down out of the city through a window via a scarlet rope. 
And the reason she did all this was because she knew that God had given the Israelites the land. She knew that they would be victorious. And I want you to listen to her declaration of faith from Joshua 2, 9 to 11. So this is Rahab talking to the spies before she's about to help them escape. She says, I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We're all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we've heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the, through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. As she declares her trust in God, she then asks the spies to protect her, and the spies make a deal. If she won't betray them, and if on the day of battle the scarlet rope is hanging from her window, then when the Israelites attack, any of her family who are inside her house will be spared. And that is exactly what happens in Joshua 6. When the walls come down, not all the walls come down. God honors the spies' arrangement. Uh, Rahab's house remains intact, and her and her family are rescued because of her faith. And what's more, our best understanding of what happens next is that Rahab actually marries one of the spies. She and her family are joined to the people of God, and Rahab becomes an ancestor of Boaz, whom we will learn about in the book of Ruth. Boaz is an ancestor of King David, and Rahab is listed as an ancestor of Jesus through this Davidic line. From lady of ill repute to spy rescuer to family of Israel to family of Jesus, Rahab's story is just another one of the amazing stories in the book of Joshua. And as we look at the overall messages of the book, uh, as we consider the overall story, there are some other incredible lessons that we can learn. And so first, as we look at the book of Joshua as a whole, uh, this book reminds us that when God is on our side, and when we are actively looking to him for wisdom, uh, great things can happen. Over and over and over in the Bible, we see God's people, as they look to God for wisdom and help, they receive wisdom and help. Uh, God moves on their behalf. Doors open. Armies disintegrate. Miracles occur. In the book of Joshua, in addition to the battle of Jericho, we see God at work in a number of other battles and in another number of other leadership moments. God is active in giving direction and correction and encouragement and help to his people. And while we might not have the same scale of battles, when we ask God for wisdom, when we look for him to move in situations, I've seen him move. And to be honest, as I think about this for our church, I need look no farther than the foyer to see those accessibility lifts. For decades, our church has struggled to find a solution to the bi-level design of our building, and time and time again, the records show frustration. Uh, broken plans, money problems, nothing seems to work. Uh, I've got a banker's box entitled Historical Records. It's where I keep all the important historical records, but uh, it really doesn't take much longer than about five minutes of kind of flipping through those historical records to encounter some attempt to solve the problem, uh, some attempt to come up with a solution. I have found uh, quotes from businesses putting up uh, to put up an exterior um, uh, steel and cement ramp. I have found a purchase invoice for an acorn stair lift, which actually wouldn't have worked in our context. Uh, at some point, they have a price but it, it never made it here. I have no idea what happened. Um, I found design after design, attempt after attempt, and, and, and nothing seemed to work. But then we prayed and fasted, uh, first in November of 2022, then in February and March of 2023, and we kept praying and praying and praying. Uh, many of you leaned into prayer, even when we'd kind of forgotten about it. You just kept praying and in God's perfect timing, a solution that we could never have dreamed of came to pass. We sought God for wisdom and help. God delivered wisdom and help. And so those lifts inspire me to keep looking to him for wisdom and help. And then the book of Joshua is like that. It's filled with stories of God's people looking to him and watching him move in power. And so the book of Joshua reminds us what happens when God is on our side. The book of Joshua is also a book that calls us to trust. Just as the book begins with that passage that I read, be strong and courageous, for God is with you wherever you go. 
So too it ends with a call to trust. That was the last page that Kathy read. After settling in the land, though many of the tribes have not been confident enough in God to fully drive out those that were there before, now Joshua calls the people together for one last pep talk in Joshua 24. And as part of that talk, Joshua calls the people to choose. He says in uh, Joshua 24, verse 14 and 15, he says, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worship when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Uh, you may have a plaque somewhere in your house that says, uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's Joshua 24. Uh, that's, what ha that's the pep talk. That's the call to action that comes from the end of the book of Joshua. Uh, and if you don't have it as a plaque, uh, if you are around church in the mid-2000s, you may have sang the Paul Balash song uh, of this verse. So anyway, uh, in this encounter, the people choose to serve God. They declare allegiance to God, but they never actually put away their idols fully. As the next book, the book of Judges, will unfold, the people continue to drift away from God. They constantly forget him, but that's not the story today, so I don't want to jump into the negative. Uh, the book of Judges will have plenty of that for all. Uh, but today, as we look at Joshua, we want to see Joshua's confident trust. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Friends, every day you are faced with that same choice. Today, whom will you serve? Who will you follow today? Will you follow the crowd? Will you follow your own fears? Will you follow your appetites, your desires, or the if it feels good, do it culture? Or will you follow the Lord, even when it doesn't make sense? Will you follow the Lord even when it is difficult or unpopular? The book of Joshua calls us to trust. And as apprentices of Jesus, as ones who are looking to spend time with Jesus and become like Jesus and do the things that Jesus did, this book is a reminder that God can be trusted even when challenges seem overwhelming. Uh, I imagine that as those Israelites crossed the Jordan River, went down into the Jericho Plain, and saw that massive fortress, I imagine that the first thought they had is, oh man, how, how are we going to get around that? Remember, these people have been enslaved for 400 years. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They are not really trained warriors. Uh, they're not really experts in battle tactics. They're, they're just a bunch of escaped slaves. And yet, as they listen to God's instruction... God moves, and so there's that call to trust. And so these are some of the good lessons from the book of Joshua. But I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't mention that there are some things that we need to wrestle with as we read the book of Joshua. This is a difficult book of the Bible because the language that it uses in the conquest is language of holy warfare. It is language of conquer. Some people go so far as to say that in this book, God commands genocide. There's a strange word in the book of Joshua. Uh, the word is harem, and it means to devote to destruction. And it is unsettling sometimes to hear God command his people to harem the resident populations. In our culture today, we have a greater awareness and understanding of the brutality of this kind of warfare. And even today, as there's conflict in Israel and Gaza, some of the narratives, some of these same narratives are being brought up. And so as Christians, we have to wrestle not only with the book of Joshua, but also the way that God's promise of land ripples through the centuries. I've heard it said that one of the greatest uh, apologetic challenges to Christians today comes from skeptics who throw the book of Joshua at us and taking it out of context and only throwing that book at us. They say, hey, what kind of God do you actually follow? <laughs> what kind of God do you serve? What kind of God says this is okay? And so as Christians throughout the years have responded to this challenge, uh, they've done so in a number of different ways. Uh, some react by throwing out the entire Old Testament. There have been pastors that have sought to solve the problem of the book of Joshua simply by cutting it out. Old Testament, old revelation, not the truest revelation of God, you just get rid of it. That's how you solve the problem, you sweep it under the rug. 
Others have sought to deal with the problem of Joshua by changing the whole way that we understand Scripture. Uh, not as real, divinely inspired historical accounts, but human-authored attempts to connect with God and direct us towards love. Now, neither of those options would be considered the historical orthodox understanding. And so as apprentices of Jesus, even as we lean into Jesus as the most complete revelation of God's will and ways, as apprentices, we do have to wrestle with Joshua. And we need to come to that place of trust, even when we don't fully understand, will we fully trust God? And I think the way that we do that, there's a number of different ways that we can do this. If you are one uh, who likes to read scholarly articles about ways to sort of understand uh, what they call the Canaanite ban, uh, email me, Nathan at centerpointchurch.ca. I can give you uh, one of my Bible school professors, one of his ways to just talk about that. But uh, for our purposes, because you don't have a full hour for the lecture, uh, for our purposes today, as we come to the book of Joshua, what I want to do is I just want to uh, help us to uh, look at the book of Joshua and to think about it in the way that we can think about all difficult passages in the Bible, not just in the book of the Joshua. I think that the way that we hold on to trust and seek understanding in the biblical text is that we come back to the cross. The cross stands at the center point of history, and all of history can be understood in light of the cross. And so as we look at the cross, and then as we look through the cross down to the book of Joshua, what do we see? How does the cross help us to make sense of all that we read about in Joshua? And as I was reflecting on some of the difficult stories in Scripture, not just in Joshua, uh, as I was thinking about some of those chapters that are difficult to read, I realized that most often difficult passages are difficult because of the presence of evil. In some cases, those passages are difficult because we see evil unchecked, nothing stopping it. Just as we read in the newspaper about humans harming one another in shocking ways, so too in the pages of Scripture, as the authors share their history with us, sometimes we see unchecked evil, and it is disgusting. It is discouraging. It is hard to read. But as I thought more about this, I also realized that some of the other passages that are uncomfortable for us are when we see evil being stopped. The flood in Genesis 7, the death of the firstborn in Exodus 12, the Canaanite ban in Joshua. Uh, we're often shocked when we see evil stopped in such violent ways. And as it relates to the book of Joshua, God warns the people of this region as early as Genesis 15 that their sin and idolatry is a problem. By the time the Israelites move into the region, the Canaanite people have been practicing some pretty dark things, such as child sacrifice, and they've been doing it for 500 years, even though they have been warned. But still in Scripture, we often see God's intervention against evil uh, as difficult to understand. But as we look again at the cross, as we discussed last Friday, there at the cross, we see unchecked evil. There, through greed and jealousy and blackmail, the innocent Son of God was tortured, mocked, beaten, crucified, and murdered. It was interesting. We, uh, I taught a class at CLBI, the Canadian Lutheran Bible Institute, on the Passion Narratives. And, and one of the things that I had the students do is just to reflect on the cross as I read the John 19 account and as we watched a little video. Uh, and one of the comments that was made by a number of the students was just how shocked they were at the way the people treated Jesus. How shocked they were at the violence, how shocked they were at the mockery, uh, how shocked they were at the unjust political system that even when declared innocent, Jesus is still murdered. Right, like that's shocking. The evil unchecked is shocking. But we should also see the uncomfortable and even shocking way that evil is defeated. Jesus steps into our mess. He allows himself to be arrested and killed so that he can take our evil upon himself, that we might be forgiven, healed, and made whole. Jesus never did anything wrong, but he took upon himself all of our wrong, all the sin that you've done, all the sin that I've done, the wrong things done to us, the wrong things done from living in this broken world. And even in a way that's difficult to understand, 
Jesus took upon himself all of the historical wrongs, the full burden of evil Jesus took upon himself, that in his death he might destroy the power of sin, Satan, and death. Through the cross and resurrection, uh, these foes are defeated, and yet until Christ's return, they are engaged in a running battle. We still experience sin, ours and others. We still experience sickness and death. Yet we have new hope. Through Jesus, there is a new and living way to a greater promised land and a greater rest. And I don't want to allegorize away the book of Joshua because God has a plan. He had a plan to bring his people into a land where they could be a light to the nations. And he had a plan to come against evil and evil practices. God had a plan to bring out of this land not only a nation, but also the promised seed, Jesus, who ultimately experienced that unchecked evil. But then in his death, he dealt a fatal blow to evil, providing a way for us to receive forgiveness, new life, and that renewed relationship with God. And so, friends, as we respond to this story, uh, as we reflect on this story, we're actually going to come to the communion table. And there at the communion table, we are reminded both, uh, both of the high cost of that new way, but also the promise of that new covenant. As we come to the table, we are going to consider uh, the problem of evil, but also God's incredible solution and the way that we might step into that new, uh, abundant, eternal life. And so in Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29, we read, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Friends, the bread and the cup both look back to Christ's death and resurrection. But they also look forward to the future when sin, Satan, and death are finally gone. And we celebrate with Jesus. And today, if you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you are invited to come and take the elements as the band sings. Uh, and then after this song, I will come up and we will eat together. I will invite you to take the posture you would like to take to reflect. We're going to fix our gaze upon Jesus uh, as we come and collect the communion elements and as we sit and reflect on Jesus on the cross. Um, so um, as you come and receive the elements and as you come back to your seat, you can sit, stand, whatever you would like. You can sing along with us. my mind on Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still
gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Fix your eyes, the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your mind on Jesus. As you hold these elements in your hand, his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. See him, see his love for you, see his goodness for you. In 1 Corinthians 11, we read these words. For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Friends, this is Christ's body broken for you. Let's eat together. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, we are in awe. We are in awe of both the high cost of human sin, that uh, dark world that we live in, Uh, but also your incredible, merciful solution. (laughs) Jesus, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that the story doesn't end at the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. And on uh, this Sunday, uh, we celebrate your uh, resurrection. It's the Lord's Day. Uh, We thank you for your grace and your goodness. We thank you that as we are joined with you, uh, we're joined with you in your death, and we're also joined with you into your new resurrection life. All of us who've placed our faith and trust in you, Jesus, we are new creations. The old has gone, the new has come. And so, Jesus, we pray that you would help us 
uh, not only to, uh, to, to step into the forgiveness, but also to step into that new abundant life that we would become more and more like you. We pray that you'd fill us anew and afresh with your spirit today. And we pray that you would also empower us by your spirit to be a people of love, uh, to be ambassadors of you, Jesus. Would you fill us uh, with your fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Would you help us to be more and more and more like you? Uh, we thank you for your body broken for us, and we thank you for your blood shed for us, and we pray that as we, uh, as we step into what you've done, that we would also step into that confident trust uh, and that continual reliance that we see in the book of Joshua. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we close our time before we head to the potluck, uh, let's say our uh, vision prayer together, uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll dismiss us for the potluck. Mm-hmm. Oh God, with all our hearts, we long for you. Make us increasingly whole as we pursue you. Jesus, grow unity among us with you at the center. May we see and value one another as fellow image bearers. Holy Spirit, fill us as we join you on mission to bring to others the hope and healing of Jesus we have received. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, we, uh, I'll dismiss you in just a second. Uh, the potluck will start soon. Uh, we just ask that you... Um, that you, if you're not helping to set up, that you stay up here for a few moments uh, just to let the, the setup happen downstairs. Uh, then as well, there's a few different people that need to use the lifts. And so I uh, just encourage you to exercise patience and uh, generosity and love towards one another in that. Uh, go in his grace. Have a great week.